Um, I also see a bunch of uh, familiar faces from uh, the people in the chat here. So I uh, wanted to make sure and say hi to uh, former or Sally Lab members as well as anybody else um, that I've met over the years um, up front. Um, with that though, I guess I'll, I'll get started with um, my, my presentation. And what I really wanna focus on today is a particular story that I think highlights uh, some interesting examples of, of enzyme neofunctionalization within plants. In particular, what I'm referring to is cryptic enzyme neofunctionalization. So examples of enzymes getting new function that would be really hard to predict um, a priori. And in this particular case, I'm focusing on uh, the biosynthesis of some neuroactive alkaline, which I'll get into. Um, and I do want to do want to point out, you know, I am assist an assistant professor at Harvard. All the work that I'm talking about today was performed uh, in the Satley Lab at Stanford. So um, it's on much of it is unpublished data, but um, it is work from my, my postdoc. So I don't think that it bears a, a large amount of uh, introduction um, uh, within this particular group, but one of the, the major things that drives my interest and many people's interest within plant chemistry um, is the ability of plants to produce uh, diverse structures that have medicinal properties. And some of the uh, clinically used pharmaceuticals that are derived from plants uh, that, we, that we, we still use today, I'm showing you here. I'm not really going into any detail about these, but the thing that I wanna highlight is that um, nature and plants in general have achieved these different, uh, these different um, chemical properties in many different ways and through many different structures. And I think investigating uh, how plants build these molecules could be really useful for, for learning more about the sort of natural chemistry and how, and the, and the different strategies that nature uses to build these, these useful molecules. And uh, fundamentally what I've been interested in um, uh, throughout the, my, uh, the recent years in my postdoc and moving forward is ultimately understanding how plants are able to take what are otherwise relatively boring building blocks, things like amino acids, isoprenoids, and acyl precursors, and through the use of different enzyme catalysts, convert these substrates into these specialized natural products that have utility in some way, shape, or form, whether they're medicines or molecules that are useful for the plant. And at a sort of higher level, um, and one of the things that we often pitch is if we understand the enzymes in the biosynthetic genes, we can then think of ways to engineer the production of these molecules. If, if there's a need, for example, producing a molecule from a plant that's hard to obtain, we could think about putting its pathway into microbes, or perhaps we could modify the metabolism of a plant itself to either produce a medicine that we can grow in the field or to add in a molecule that might be useful to the, the fitness of a crop plant. Um, I think more fundamentally for me, what, I, what really drives my, my interest and curiosity is that because many of these biosynthetic pathways in uh, plants are not well understood, there's a really great opportunity through studying these pathways to learn about new types of enzymes as well as new catalytic reactions and, and catalytic reactions that we wouldn't have expected in particular um, groups of proteins. And during my postdoc, I um, focused on how plants make a couple of different uh, medicinal alkaloids. So one of these is colchicine, which has been historically used as a treatment for inflammation. And we had a lot of success in uh, understanding how plants build this particular molecule. But today I wanna to focus on another molecule that I worked on during my postdoc, this molecule, Huberzine A, which has been explored as a potential treatment for uh, dementia as well as some other neurological conditions. So Huberzine A, or, or Hoop A, as I'll re refer to it throughout the talk, uh, is a major alkaloid that's produced in club mosses, which are these, these plants that belong to the Lycopodiaceae family. So these are really early diverging land plants. And the most well-known activity associated with Huberzine A is its ability to bind to and inhibit acetylcholine esterase. This is an enzyme that's really important with the neural signaling in mammalian brains. And because of its inhibitory activity, Hupe has been explored uh, as a potential treatment for a number of different neurological conditions in which acetylcholine levels are compromised. Most notably among these are, are treatments for Alzheimer's disease. We can see here there's a number of different neurological conditions that have been explored um, for, for Hupe's DNA to be used as a pharmaceutical. At a more basic level, if you look in these plants that produce uh, Huperzine A, you find that they're actually chock full of a, a huge number of structurally diverse alkaloids that are all biogenically related. Um, so these are collectively referred to as the lycopodian alkaloids. And Huperzine A is just one out of over 300 unique molecules or unique lycopodium alkaloids, I should say, that are produced within these plants. And so for me, this represented a really great um, territory to try to explore um, in terms of a branch of plant metabolism that really had not been well defined, where we could try to isolate these unique enzyme activities or, or new. Um, biosynthetic transformations. 
of course, the major question, especially for uh, plants like these that are relatively uncharacterized at the metabolic level, is how do we actually find the relevant enzymes uh, within these branches of uncharacterized plant metabolism? And the way that we've done this with a lot of success within the Satley lab, and I think there's other groups that have done this really well um, also, is to rely upon the conditional production of specialized metabolites in plants. And what I mean by this is that these molecules usually aren't produced everywhere all the time in the plant. Uh, they're often produced in a specific tissue type during a particular developmental stage, or perhaps under some kind of environmental stress. You can think of like an insect chewing on a leaf and inducing the production of a defense-related molecule. Uh, correspondingly, what you'd expect then is that the molecule is going to be being made in certain places at certain times. The underlying biosynthetic gene should only be expressed where the molecule is actively being made. And so the first thing you can do, uh, relatively straightforward, perform metabolomic analyses to try to determine an active site of biosynthesis. And so you might profile different tissues at different times to try to find when and where your molecule is actively being made. And then you can pair, you can pair this with transcriptomic profiling to try to associate gene expression with biosynthesis. And we've done this through RNA sequencing. This is pretty common these days. And through sequencing these different tissues, we can begin to build co-expression networks of genes that are expressed in the right place and that are likely involved in the same uh, metabolic pathway of interest. Uh, so in the case of Hooper's DNA, the first thing that we wanted to do in terms of following that strategy was to identify when and where this molecule is being made. And I'm not going to go into a lot of detail about this today. Um, I'm going to sort of just summarize our results. Uh, but we were working in this Hooper's DNA producing plant, Flammarius tetrasticus. I'm not going to say the name again because it's a bit of a mouthful. Um, but really to summarize a, a decent amount of work that included metabolomic profile and isotope labeling, we were able to identify this new growth at the, tube of the tip of the shoot as the major site of Hooper's DNA accumulation and active biosynthesis. And so with this information uh, in hand, we can then move forward with RNA sequencing of our plant. And this included sequencing of both its biosynthetically active tissue, as well as biosynthetically inactive tissues throughout the plant in order to provide a handle for um, differential expression analyses. However, as you might expect, after performing this, this RNA sequencing, what you end up with are tens of thousands of unique transcripts. And so this, what this really becomes then is a bioinformatics challenge of how do we actually identify the relevant pathway genes for our particular pathway and molecule of interest. And this leads me into another major concept that we relied upon in the Sally lab, and I think is really critical for understanding these metabolic pathways in nature. And that is using biosynthetic or chemical logic to try to guide which genes we should actually be focusing on within our transcriptomic data set. And so what I mean by this is that if we have an understanding of the underlying chemical transformations that are occurring within the plant. We can make a reasonable guess about the, about the classes of enzymes that are catalyzing those chemical reactions so we can narrow down our list of, of genes that we need to look into. In the case of Hooper's DNA, we knew from prior uh, isotope tracer studies that have been ongoing since the 1960s, that this molecule is ultimately derived from the amino acid lysine, as well as from a polyketide building block, malonyl coa These tracer studies further laid out that lysine is likely decarboxylated to form a polyamine, uh, that this polyamine is oxidized to form a heterocyclic imine, which I'm showing you here in blue. Uh, these studies also show that malonyl coa is likely chain elongated to form this polyketide that I'm showing you here. Uh, and we can sort of further infer that this polyketide is condensed with this heterocyclic imine, to produce these two key precursors to the lycopodium alkaloids. Now, this is basically the extent of what we knew from the isotope tracer studies, but from here, you can begin to make some, some reasonable guesses about how these subgroups might be put together to form a tetracyclic scaffold molecule. And then from here, you just need a series of oxidative tailoring reactions in order to produce Hooper's DNA itself. And while on the surface, this might seem like a lot of information, and it might not be clear where to begin, we can actually break this down into pieces and, and gain some, some real insight into the type of enzymes that we should be looking into. So for example, at the beginning of this pathway, I pointed out that lysine is likely decarboxylated to form this polyamine. Well, we know of enzymes in the literature and in, and in nature that can catalyze this reactions, specifically lysine decarboxylases. And these are actually very easy to uh, pick out of a transcriptomic data set. They're very easy to um, predict computationally. And so what we can do is look specifically for lysine decarboxylase genes that are highly expressed in our biosynthetically active tissue, and then use this as a bait gene within co-expression analysis to try to find other genes um, that, sh that share really high um, co-expression with this and that might be involved within the same pathway. So for example, we might look for copper amine oxidase genes that are known to catalyze the oxidation of polyamines. We might look for polyketide synthases that could, that could use malonyl-CoA as a substrate. And for these downstream oxidative tailoring reactions, 
we're going to look for the sort of the, the common players within plants, cytochrome P450 and 2 oxygenase dependent dioxygenases. And so if we use this Beijing strategy, if we specifically look for lysine decarboxylase that's highly expressed within the new growth of our plant, and then use this as our bait within a co-expression analysis, what we can find is that out of over 40,000 unique transcripts within the top 25 correlating to this lysine decarboxylase, we can identify copper oxidase homologs, type 3 polyketide synthase homologs, and a number of unique 2 oxyglutarate dependent dioxygenases or 2-ODDs. And so it seemed like this really simple co-expression analysis had allowed us to identify many of the putative candidates that we think could be involved within our biospecific pathway. And so with these candidates in hand, we now need a way to test these rapidly to actually confirm and verify their function. And to do this, we use a system that I think many of you are familiar with, but I'm going to go through it in some detail just to make sure that we're all on the same page. Um, and the main system that, that I've used in the past is um, agrobacterium-mediated transient expression. And so just like any other system, once we have our genes of interest identified, we can clone them out from, from cDNA from the plant or we can synthesize them um, commercially. And then we move these candidate genes into an agrobacterium strain library. And in, in this library, each of the individual strains contains one candidate gene of interest. And then we actually use these agrobacterium strains to infect and transform a plant host. In this case, we use Nicotiana ventamiana. And uh, in a very simple way of looking at this, if you have one agrobacterium strain containing one gene construct of interest, um, you use this strain to infect the plant leaf, it will actually transform uh, the plant cells with your, your, your gene construct of interest. And at that point, the plant machinery will take over where you then get expression of your gene of interest and then production of the relevant protein. So for example, if you do this with GFP, you can see in, in leaves that were successfully infiltrated, you get this green fluorescence. You can actually see on this leaf on the right where we failed to infiltrate the leaf. Um, you don't get this, this green fluorescence. The really wonderful thing about this system that we've been able to take advantage of is that you can do this with multiple strains harboring multiple genes simultaneously. So you can basically take a mixture of, for example, four strains containing four different genes, mix them in equal proportion, use them to infect the leaf, and you'll get co-transformation and expression of four genes simultaneously, and then co-production of multiple proteins at the same time in the leaf. And this is critical for, for two different reasons. The first is that this allows for combinatorial batch testing of enzymes. So we can test enzymes much more quickly than just one at a time. And this also allows us to build our pathways in plant in real time. And this allows us to access substrates we might not otherwise have access to. So for example, if we identify a candidate, candidate one that can take a substrate from the plant A and convert it into B, we can then test additional candidate genes on top of this that could potentially take B and convert it into C. And so in this way, we're able to generate our substrate in planta and at the same time, step-by-step step engineer the biosynthesis of our molecule of interest as we discover new genes. If our molecule of interest is not natively present within the tobacco leaf, we can, we can infiltrate our substrate just as you would add a substrate to a test tube for an in vitro enzyme reaction. And then after several days of incubation, um, we can extract our metabolites and maybe perform targeted or untargeted metabolomics to look for the disappearance of substrate or the appearance of new molecules. We typically do this through LCMS detection. And so through this process, we were, very, we were very quickly able to show that the lysine decarboxylase and the copper amine oxidase genes that we had identified uh, do indeed act on lysine supplied by the plant host to convert it into this heterocyclic amine that I'm showing you here, pretty much as we would have expected. And we were further able to show that the type 3 polyketide synthase we had identified uh, catalyzes not only this chain elongation with malonyl CoA, but also the subsequent condensation with this heterocyclic amine to form these two key uh, precursors to the lycopodium alkaloids I'm showing you here. And there's two things uh, at this point, uh, particularly about the polyketide synthase that I want to point out that are going to be important for, for later in my talk. So the first thing, uh, and these are, I guess you could just say some interesting observations for now. The first thing is that this polyketide synthase also generates this polyketide free acid. We were, weren't really sure what to make of this initially, but we did, we did notice that this, this compound accumulates um, when we added malonyl CoA with our, with our enzyme. The other thing that we noticed was that the pelletyrium product that's made by this reaction is racemic. And this is somewhat odd for a biosynthetic enzyme. There's usually an selectivity in these reactions, but we can, we can see here through chiral chromatography is that we get, an e we get equal production of both R and S pelletyrium. Um, and just keep this in mind for later because it'll be important for some of the, the, the items I talk about. Um, at any rate though, we had very quickly established this early part of the lycopodium alkaloid biosynthetic pathway. We were able to achieve the production of these molecules um, and basically um, exhaust everything that we knew about the isotope tracer studies that we performed in this plant. And while it was great that we, we found these enzymes, um, we also at this point kind of came to a roadblock. 
And in large part, this was due to the fact that we didn't know how you got from these two substrates all the way through to the scaffold or to, to Hooper's DNA itself. And what had been proposed previously in the literature, somewhat speculatively, is that this, this tetracyclic scaffold was formed through the condensation of 4PAA and pelletyrene um, themselves. So you could sort of reorient these in three-dimensional space. And you can sort of draw in fake bonds to imagine how you would get from these substrates to this tetracyclic scaffold. However, this was a, somewhat problematic because when we looked at this, it wasn't obvious to us what type of enzyme could actually catalyze this reaction. And we also didn't know if these substrates needed to be modified any further. So we are at a bit of an impasse, at least in terms of using our chemical logic. Because of this, we chose to rely very heavily on our transcriptomic co-expression data set. As I pointed out to you before, the genes within our pathway um, co-expressed very strongly. And so we took a, a slightly more sophisticated approach to look at co-expression of the genes in our plant. In particular, we used hierarchical clustering to try to put um, genes to, to co-express clusters that might be involved in the same pathway. And when we did this, we were able to identify a relatively small cluster of transcripts that contained 131 unique transcripts. And this particular cluster contained all of the identified pathway gene homologs that we had previously identified. And it was also highly enriched for a number of different metabolic enzymes that are commonly implicated um, within plant metabolism, as well as some other metabolic enzymes that we weren't really sure how they would fit in. But nonetheless, this seemed like a, a very rich um, cluster of genes to test within our pathway. And since we didn't actually know what type of enzyme to be looking for, we took a very we came up with a very naive hypothesis, and that was basically perhaps our genes are so well expressed that all of the genes in Hooper's DNA biosynthesis are simply found within this cluster. And so we sort of took the, the, the hammer approach to this particular problem, and we just went about systematic batch testing the different metabolic genes um, within this cluster. And I don't want to go into all the details, but this turned out to be um, fairly fruitful for us as we were able to find a number of different enzymes that could push this pathway forward. So for example, we were able to find a pair of short chain dehydrogenase reductase enzymes that could each catalyze the reduction of pelletyrene to produce um, this molecule that I'm showing you here. And one of the interesting things about this is that was at, these enzymes are actually able to take both enantiomers of pelletyrene to produce a mixture of stereoisomers of this, this alcohol that I'm showing you here. Similarly, we were able to find an acetyltransferase that could then acetylate this molecule, again, uh, in a non-stereoselective um, way to produce a mixture of stereoisomers. We found a P450 that catalyzed um, an oxidation and subsequent elimination to produce this dyne that I'm showing you here. And then we were ultimately able to find a pair of enzymes um, that could produce this scaffold, this putative scaffold molecule that I'm, I'm showing you here. And we were eventually able to back out in part by the consumption of substrates. You can see here consumption of this dyne as well as 4PAA. Now the scaffold is actually being formed through a condensation of this dyne molecule with S4PAA as I'm showing you here. And what I want to point out about these particular uh, discoveries that we, that we were able to um, uh, find through this approach is that some of these are, are relatively unexpected. For example, this reduction um, in O-acetylation, we never would have guessed based upon the structure of Huprazine because this chemical moiety is ultimately lost in the formation of this dyne. So we couldn't have gone in expecting to look for these particular activities. Um, however, I think the most exciting thing that came out of this particular approach are these scaffold forming enzymes. And if you're wondering what CAH stands for, what we actually found were that a pair of carbonic anhydrase family enzymes were actually responsible um, for catalyzing this condensation to form this, this, this scaffold molecule that I'm showing you here. And this was pretty surprising to us because uh, if you look throughout the literature, really the only activity that's ever been shown within the carbonic anhydrase family is the interconversion of CO2 and bicarbonate. And this is a really critical enzyme reaction throughout all of nature. It's important for things like CO2 solubilization, concentrating, and pH control. Um, but this appears to be the first time or the first identification of these enzymes acting within a biosynthetic pathway, or at least acting directly within a biosynthetic pathway. And we'd also found the surprising co-functionality um, where both of these carbonic anhydrase enzymes were necessary for this reaction to occur um, fully. And actually very recently, um, through some work that was performed with um, uh, a grad student in the lab, in the Sally lab, Urine, and a rotation student in the, uh, in the Sally lab, Daria, um, they were able to establish in vitro enzyme assays with isolated protein to kind of get at what might be happening um, with these, these different carbonic anhydrase enzymes. And what they were able to find is that if you have um, this Ka1 enzyme on its own, you don't get production of the scaffold. Uh, if you have Ka2 on its own, you get a little bit of production, but, but really not very much. If you take these two enzyme extracts and mix them together, 
you don't see any increase in the formation of this, this compound, which was, which was kind of surprising. However, if you co-express these, these enzymes within the same tobacco leaf and then purify your enzyme, we could get this full activity um, as I'm showing you here. And so this was, this was kind of curious and it, it brought up this question of, of why would these proteins actually need to be co-expressed? And we don't have the full answer to this right now. I think this is, this is an active area of research that we're all looking to um, uh, further pursue. Um, but June from the, the Sally Lab I had, had a lot of help on these, these final product, uh, product uh, projects. Uh, June was able to run some Western blots with his tag enzymes from uh, expressing them in tobacco. And so he was able to show that um, while Ka1 is very well expressed at the right molecular weight, so these are about 30 kilodaltons or so in size, Ka2 did not express very well. You can maybe see a very faint band, but certainly in comparison to Ka1, there's not very much. However, when you co-express these enzymes um, and you have your, your histag of Ka2 that you're probing for via Western blot, what you find is not only an increase in the abundance of these enzymes, um, but also these higher molecular weight proteins that, that um, are, are relating to, to Ka2 uh, proteoforms. And this suggests there might be some critical post-translational modifications that are occurring um, that might be important for the, uh, the folding function or subcellular localization of these proteins. And at this point, I don't really know the, the answer to that question, but I think this is a really exciting area to pursue in the future. Um, however, once we had um, found these carbonic anhydrases, um, we decided to ask another really naive um, um, hypothetical question. And that is, since some carbonic anhydrases are involved in this meta metabolic pathway, is it possible that other um, Ka family enzymes could play a broader role in biosynthesis or within this particular metabolic pathway. And so we looked specifically within our transcriptome for other carbonic anhydrases that had strong co-expression to our pathway genes. In this case, we set our Pearson's R at, at 0 0.8. We were able to identify six carbonic anhydrase candidates. And sure enough, we were able to find an additional carbonic anhydrase that when we added it into our co-express system, we saw a roughly threefold increase in the abundance of the scaffold molecule, suggesting that this enzyme was doing something within the context of our biosynthetic pathway. So then the question obviously was, what is CA3 doing within biosynthesis? And this brings me back to one of these critical points that I pointed out earlier. And that is um, this, what you might think of as a side activity associated with this polyketide synthase enzyme. And I'd pointed out that um, this also generates this, this free three oxglutaric acid. And I don't have, a, have time to go in all to exactly how we got to this particular conclusion. I think there's a lot of twists and turns that led us to this. But eventually, we were, we were, we were led to, to suspect that CA3 could have some role um, in utilizing this particular diacid, as well as this heterocyclic imine, um, as substrates. And this is somewhat complicated, as if you just mix these two substrates together that I'm showing you in a test tube, you get spontaneous formation of the enantiomers of 4-PAA, as well as spontaneous decarboxylation to form pelletyrin. These are all reactions that could just happen without an enzyme catalyst. And in fact, if you have uh, a GFP enzyme ex extract, and you put these two substrates together, you do indeed see this racemic mixture of pelletyrium that forms. However, if we add in CA3 to this, this particular reaction mixture, what we can see is that over time, we see no increase in the R enantiomer of pelletyrium, but we see the time-dependent increase in this S enantiomer um, of pelletyrium, suggesting that CA3 is doing something within this particular um, branch of metabolism. And if we look specifically at the formation of 4-PAA, we can see this ex accelerated rate of formation of this molecule in comparison to our, the spontaneous reaction that occurs under the GFP control. And what this suggests then is that CA3 is actually catalyzing the stereospecific spe condensation between 3 octutaric acid and 1-piperidine to specifically form um, S4-PAA. And so with this in mind, then we can begin to build a model for the scaffold generation that's occurring within lycopodium alkaloid biosynthesis. And in particular, we can sort of break this down into parts. So we have this early precursor generation. So we have our lysine decarboxylase and copper amine oxidase that are producing this heterocyclic amine, as well as our polyketide synthase that's taking malleolic way to produce this, this ketide uh, product that I'm showing you here. This polyketide synthase then further condenses this ketide with, with this, this heterocyclic amine to produce a racemic mixture of 4-PAA that can decarboxylate to form a racemic mixture of pelletyrin. And then you have this stereochemistry independent synthesis of this dyne where these, these, this, these STRs, ACT, and P450 enzymes don't really seem to care all that much about the stereochemistry of the substrate, and they all seem to achieve the production of the same molecule. At the same time, you have this production of this diacid um, by this polyketide synthase, um, and it seems to be able to join together 
through excretoric acid with this heterocyclic imine to specifically produce S4PAA. And then this is the very substrate that's eventually coupled with this dyne molecule that I'm showing you here to produce this particular scaffold. And this is, this is currently our working model for how we're actually able to build um, this scaffold with these like according to alkaline producing plants. And one thing that I want to point out here is this really striking neofunctionalization of the, these, these cot enzymes, kind of bringing you back to this point. Um, and I don't want to go into a lot of detail about the mechanism of these enzymes, but one thing that's really important for their function is this histidine triad that coordinates uh, a zinc ion. And this is, this is important for the sort of textbook catalysis that these enzymes um, accomplish. And the zinc ion is important for, for these particular steps. Um, and if you look across all kingdoms of life, including bacteria, algae, fungi, um, animals, and plants, um, what you'll find is that this histidine triad is really highly conserved as are a number of other active site residues um, within these enzymes that act as canonical carbonic anhydrases. But if you look within the carbonic anhydrases that we had identified within like a podium alkaloid biosynthesis, you find these really striking mutations to, to not just the histidine triad, but also these other active site residues. And I think this, this, this suggests that uh, carbonic anhydrases uh, might be able to be identified in other species based upon these sort of signature mutations. So this is something that we're looking to explore in the future. Uh, at this point, I want to sort of bring you back to where we are in Cooper's DNA biosynthesis because I think I feel like this could have got lost in all the noise. I'm sort of getting up to um, the formation of the scaffold. But if you orient this particular molecule or reorient this molecule in three-dimensional space, and you can see that it's only a couple of biosynthetic transformations away from achieving this tetracyclic scaffold that we are hoping to form within the context of Hubris and A biosynthesis. Once we're able to, to achieve this tetracyclic scaffold, we then just need to look into the oxidations that actually produce Hubris and A itself. And we don't yet know the, the final enzymes that are involved in forming this tetracyclic scaffold, but one of the questions that we wanted to ask was, could we actually jump into downstream biosynthesis to try to characterize these, these final oxidative tailoring steps that are required for producing cuprosine A? Uh, and we were lucky in that many alkaloids have been isolated from cuprosine A producing plants that appear to be logical precursors to cuprosine A itself. And so I've, I've laid these in sort of a logical order where you can sort of go from left to right all the way to cuprosine A. And we were very fortunate to have a, um, a collaborator, um, Yang Yi Lo from the University of Malaya, who had isolated and structurally verified uh, many of these different substrates and was able to provide these substrates to us so that we could test them within our Nicotian and Benthamiana expression system. So we could test many of those ex oxidative enzymes that we identified through our co-expression um, analysis. And I'm not gonna go into a lot of detail here in the interest of time, but basically what we were able to show is that starting with this, this highly reduced tetracyclic uh, precursor flobelidine, we were able to identify a number of different enzymes, including uh, two oxyglutarate dependent dioxygenases, as well as an alpha beta hydrolase that can step-by-step -step convert this molecule all the way through to Hooper's DNA itself. And so we were able to establish relatively quickly a pathway for getting from an upstream precursor all the way through to the actual pharmaceutical molecule. And uh, we were able to mix and match these enzymes um, to gain a little bit more information about how lycopodium alkaloids may be existing as a metabolic network in the native plants. And through doing this, we were able to show um, that we could actually produce a number of different alkaloids by leaving out some of our particularly desaturases within this pathway. And by doing this, we were able to explain a lot of the chemical diversity that we see within Hooper's and producing plants and ultimately provide access to 16 unique alkaloids that could be produced from this single um, flabellidine precursor. And another thing that I, a really interesting aspect that came out of this, and um, I think it's more of just a, an interesting observation more than anything else, um, but you can start to make some, um, some stru structure function type relationships about how these biosynthetic modifications might be leading towards an optimized acetylcholine esterase inhibitor. So I sort of preface this talk by saying that Hooper's DNA has been um, explored be because of its ability to inhibit acetylcholine esterase, and it does this at a relatively low IC50, about 82 nanomolar. However, as you work your way back within the pathway, what you find is that you see this, this decrease in the ability of these alkaloids to inhibit acetylcholine esterase. And as you move further and further away, you see less and less activity or no activity at all. And so it seems like through evolution, the plant perhaps is um, tailoring the, uh, the structure of these molecules, maybe to achieve a, a particular structure that is, is optimized for inhibiting a particular enzyme. We don't know that acetylcholine esterase is the, the target that's been uh, evolved to be hit by these molecules in the native plants, but I think it is interesting. It is an interesting aspect to, to think about. And what I wanna leave you with uh, with this particular, this particular story 
is that, again, the striking co-expression of these metabolic genes. So if, we, if I bring you back to this cluster of 131 transcripts, we can identify all of the genes that I talked about with the exception of two within this very small cluster of transcripts, suggesting that there's really strong um, co-expression of these genes. So this is 14 out of 16 pathway genes. And within this cluster, if you're counting for homologs and redundancies, this amounts to roughly one in four transcripts within this co-expressed cluster belonging to the Hooper's DNA pathway. Um, and I think this is really pointing to the fact that we've identified a metabolic regulon or a set of genes that are all under the same transcriptional control and are all involved like within the same metabolic pathway. And so I think by further exploring this, um, this particular cluster and maybe slightly expanded cluster, we'll be able to find the final enzymes um, involved in the biosynthesis of Cooper's DNA. Um, and when I say the final enzymes, you know, I talked to you today about how we've been able to achieve this early module biosynthesis to access this key scaffold, as well as these, these down, this downstream module, we can sort of convert this tetracyclic scaffold into Cooper's DNA. Uh, the final part that we're really looking to explore in the future are these, these final uh, transformations to convert this key scaffold into Flavelli itself. All right, so with that, I want to uh, conclude my presentation. Uh, I want to make sure and just re-highlight uh, people that contributed significantly significantly to this work, in particular, um, Yurine and June, um, who are, who are uh, circled here. Um, obviously, I want to thank everybody in the Satley Lab um, for a great postdoc experience. Um, and I want to, you know, obviously highlight that I'm looking to expand my new group here at, at Harvard. Um, so if you're curious about learning a little bit more about my lab or about the, the open position within the department, please feel free to email me, um, check out my website. Um, other than that, I'm happy to take any questions that you might have. Thank you very much, Ryan. Um, impressive talk, um, like really, really wow. Um, do we have any questions? I see there's one question in the chat, but if you have questions that um, just please raise your hand and <clears throat> we will go through. Them. Yeah, Benjamin, please. Hi there. Um, sorry, I can't really see. I assume you can hear me, uh, but I can't yep. really tell. Um, yeah, amazing talk, really. Interesting work, really uh, ex exciting um, with these carbonic anhydrases. I'm just the the main sort of um, you know the central the scaffold forming step in the pathway where you are evoking both the polyketide synthase and the carbonic anhydrase. I mean, I'm one. Do you, do you need the polyketide synthase to be uh, doing this scaffold forming step? Do you is the PKS really catalyzing that reaction and if so, do you see the R series within the plants themselves, or do you think that could be just your kind of implanter benth experiments? Yeah. So, in in regards to the the the, the question of whether the polyketide synthase is necessary, um, strictly speaking, no. I mean, that reaction can can um, can happen spontaneously. That condensation between the ketide and the heterocyclic imine. We showed previously that the, the rate of this reaction is accelerated with the presence of the, of the enzyme. So to the, to the best of our knowledge, the polyketide synthase is catalyzing that condensation of some ketide. We don't know exactly what the ketide is at this point. We have a guess, but we're not certain. Yeah. Um, it's still strange that the, the, the mixture is in, it's an enantiomeric mixture that's being formed since it is happening, since we think it's happening enzymatically. We don't really, we can't fully rationalize that right now. As to, as to identifying um, different enantiomers within the native plants, I have not looked at that specifically. So I, I, I can't tell you whether or not we see, say like both R and S um, pelletering within the native plant, but I, but I can say that we see that when we reconstitute biosynthesis heterologously. Right, so then the dom, I mean, could if, if these reactions are happening within the same compartment, could the dominant, um, you know, can, enzyme catalyzing condensation be the carbonic anhydrase three. Would that be possible? It's possible. I think, I mean, the interesting aspect is that there's the fact that the downstream, the SDRs, the acetyl transferases, and the P450s can all accommodate um, different diastereomers of these compounds, which would make me think that they, I mean, they can at least tolerate them. And that sort of leads me to think that perhaps in the actual plant, they're, act, they're, act, they're acting on, on both of those right. substrates. Uh, the question of why, why not just why not just use one, especially if you're losing those stereo centers eventually, uh, I'm not really mm -hmm. sure. What I can point out, and that you you sort of this is maybe maybe I'm jumping the gun a little bit, but um, 
we do know, and this is sort of my, my supplementary slide that I was hoping <laughs> somebody would ask something in relation to this. Uh, we know that the, these carbonic anhydrases are actually separated in space from the rest of the enzymes in the pathway. Uh, they appear to be localized to the apoplast, whereas everything else appears to be cytosolic or you know, tethered to the ER and exposed to the cytosol. And so we think there is some separation between these upstream steps to produce this dyeing and then this, do this downstream condensation to actually form the scaffold. I'm, I have transporters here as though I know that transport is happening. And these are all experiments that have been done in Benthi. We haven't identified transporters or anything, but the localization of these enzymes suggests that there is a, there is a spatial um, component that's important and that the polyketide synthase might need to be catalyzing the reaction in the cytosol. The carbonic anhydrase might need to be catalyzing a specific enantiomer in the apoplast, but that's pretty much all we know at this point. Wow, yes. Yeah. <laughs> very interesting. Thank you very much. Yeah. Yeah. I just want to um, jump to the um, question in the chat real quick. Um, we have a question from Haley Carter um, that brings up a lot of questions about how the like what they're using these compounds themselves. How much is known on that subject? How much? What the native plant is using the molecules for? Yes. Yeah. So, to my knowledge, there's there's not really any information that looks at the function of these molecules within the context of the native plant or any sort of semblance of a native interaction. I think, you know, my best guess, the fact that it's an acetylcholine esterase inhibitor would suggest that it's probably an antifeedant that could impact insects as well as mammals or other animals. Um, Hooper's DNA itself, as well as some of these other alkaloids accumulate to really high levels. And so to me, that's sort of in line with them being defense molecules. I think also the fact that we see them accumulate to the highest levels in actively growing tissue, which from my perspective, if I was a plant, that'd be my most precious tissue that I want to protect. Um, and so, you know, packing that full of toxic alkaloids makes sense to me, but this is all speculative. We don't really know what they're doing in a native context. Yeah, yeah, but makes a lot of sense. Then thanks. And the next question, um, Bill, please. Uh, so it's sort of actually the segue to the previous question. It takes a lot of energy to to build up a new biosynthetic pathway, and it seems to me that your approach is really only looking at at um, either um, new transcription or stabilization of existing messenger RNAs. Whereas in animal cells, there's a very very significant amount of control that occurs at the level of, of stabilization of proteins of pre-existing proteins, um, and and would you comment on that? Yeah, I think it's a, I think it's a good, good point. And it's, it's not something that, it's something that we hope is not usually the case when we're performing these pathway discovery projects because we're relying on um, a transcriptomic output. Um, we're really hoping that our genes are only expressed where the molecule is being made in order to give us this really fine resolution for co-expression analyses. Um, I mean, I think in this particular case, both the CA1 and CA2 uh, were highly co-expressed with the pathway transcriptionally, but we did have this extra flavor of some sort of interaction that might be influencing protein stability or pulse translation modification. I can't speak to that in too much more detail because I really, at this point, we really just don't know. Um, but it's, it's not something that we, we explore in a lot of details. It's sort of like the, you know, an enzyme already be present. Uh, uh, in a particular tissue type and uh, not not necessarily correlating at the transcriptional level. Um, but yeah, I think it's, it's something important to, to consider. I know there are there are groups that have also leveraged proteome, like shotgun proteomics type approaches of biosynthetically active tissues, which is obviously getting you much closer to the question than, than transcriptomics is. So um, I think all of these techniques are complementary and probably necessary for finding um, uh, enzymes of any of these pathways. And maybe that's the missing piece for like why we can't find the, the final enzymes here. Um, we just don't know at this point. All right. Um, do we have more questions in the audience? Okay, Alexander, please. Yeah. Yes. Um, so getting back to this uh, post-translational modification of those two enzymes, have you done any proteomics on that to see if there's any modification of those? Uh, what, what are those higher molecular weight bands in yeah. your Western life? So the, the short answer is that I don't know. Um, the, the longer answer is that it's something that we're, we're quite interested in pursuing. 
Uh, my sus there is a precedence for secreted carbonic anhydrase to be and glycosylated, and you know the, the the higher molecular weight bands I think would point to some some end glycans being formed. So that's my best guess, um, and that's something that we wanted to to actively pursue. But if that is the case, um, you know I pointed to this sort of apoplastic targeting of these proteins, and it's it not only has been shown that carbonic anhydrase as well as other proteins can be end glycosylated, but that these particular glycans are critical for making sure that they get shuttled to the right place in the plant. And so it, there could be multiple things at play here. It could be that the post translational modifications are important for stability, maybe for the, the protein having the right conformation to, to perform catalysis, but it also could just be making sure that it gets to the right place and that it's only functional in the right environment. And if you're not in that environment, then you just don't see activity. But it's a super interesting thing to, to look into. I'm, I'm, I'm really uh, excited to explore those higher molecular weight bands which ones are relevant? Maybe some are just artifacts in Benthi. Um, but sorry, Nikosjana, Benthamiana. Benthi is my short for that. But, um, um, but yeah, at this point, we just we don't know for sure. Thank you. All right, um, we have another question from Benjamin. Great, thank you very much. Thanks for indulging me in my uh, questions. So um, these. So this pathway is also known, or I think it's similar in other plants, like in uh, in like Lucanus and other uh, Fabaceae sort of plants. And they, um, I think the idea is that they are considered to be kind of evolutionarily separated, but they still might have the challenge of this condensation step. So I guess the question is, uh, have you looked for carbonic anhydrases in other kind of evolutionarily separated similar pathways? Um, or perhaps you might have some thoughts of what sort of enzymes could be catalyzing those sorts of conversations. Yeah, so like the like the quinolizidine alkaloids uh, in particular, like there's a lot of structural semblance. Uh, well, not just structural, also as you pointed out, it's early biosynthetic semblance to, to this pathway. Um, I've refrained a little bit from specifically looking into that pathway because I know that there are others that are actively um, pursuing that. Um, what I will say is that I. I have a suspicion, I, I think I hinted to it, but that these carbonic anhydrases are, um, this is probably not the only example in nature. Uh, I don't have evidence that they've, they've, they've popped up in other places, but it's hard for me to believe that there could just be this one instance of neofunctionalization, particularly that we've identified three that are critical within the context of this pathway. So I think just like any other metabolic enzyme or any other enzyme for that matter, um, you know, these carbonic anhydrases serve as a reservoir for, for duplication and neofunctionalization. And um, the, the approach that we're taking is to look at specific, most specifically at the histidine triad, because that is so well conserved. And if you just look in publicly available databases, you can find sequences where the histidine triad is mutated. Is that meaningful? Maybe. It might just mean that they're dead enzymes, but um, it is something that, that uh, I'm particularly interested in pursuing in, in the near future. So I, I, I have a suspicion, but I can't say that it's been confirmed. Do, do you think it's that the, the carbonic anhydrase is kind of related to the, the carbon dioxide as a product? It's like there's some, you know, there's still, carbon dioxide is still involved somehow in, in the enzyme mechanism. Yeah. So way. for both of the both of the cases that we found where they're acting in catalysis, yeah, it's, it's being driven by loss of CO2. So that's a pretty tempting, I think, uh, way to think about it. Since N is two here, it's it's a little bit hard to say, like just through the nature of this path. But but I, but I also think that that could be sort of a nice uh, way to approach this problem, especially when we're talking about like across all the plant metabolism. Maybe there is going to be this bias towards carboxylates and carboxylate mediated chemistry um, within biosynthesis. But you know, speculation at this point. But I think it is something that is. Um, We've, we've kicked around as a possible. Great, that's a great starting point. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, thank you. <clears throat> thank you. Um, do we have any other questions in the audience? Feel also free to just put them in the chat. If not, I have like one, um, one question. I was wondering um, how much did you have to deal with um, um, Nicosiana bentamiana endogenous um, genes that basically kind of um, interacted on several of the intermediates in your pathway. Was there a lot of um, side reactions that you observed? Yeah, so uh, in general, the closer to 
endogenous metabolism that you get, or close to primary metabolism, the more that we saw this. So, for example, I think this has been published on, not necessarily with this specific lysine decarboxylase, I think maybe the one from um, Lupin. Um, but if you add in a lysine decarboxylase to tobacco, you there's like a thousand new molecules that are made. It's, that's an over exaggeration, but there's a lot of new molecules that are made, um, and they're quite abundant. And so, like I think once you you know convert this into cadaverine, that could be taken in multiple different directions. Some of the nicotine-related alkaloids are, are taking advantage of lysine-derived um, heterocycles as well. So I think tobacco in particular is able to deal with a lot of these intermediates that we're producing. Um, basically, once we get past the polyketide synthase step, um, there doesn't seem to be a ton of other uh, interference from tobacco metabolism, but certainly in these, these early steps, where the lysine decarboxylase and copper amine oxidase in particular, we observe a lot of molecular changes that are not apparently related to our particular biosynthetic pathway. Okay, thank you. Yeah, if we don't have any other questions, I would like to thank everybody for attending today. Um, I don't know how much time Ryan has. I know he has to leave for an appointment, I think at one, um, but if we have like, um, I don't know, one yeah. or two more, more um, detailed questions, please stay. Um, online. Um, otherwise, um, I see each each of you hopefully back um, in two weeks. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. And if, if you want, you can also just stop sharing your screen now. Yeah. Great. Thanks. Bye bye. Bye. Oops. I've lost my. Oh, there we go. Yeah, thank you very much. It was a great talk. Um, a lot of areas covered. Yeah, hopefully, hopefully not digging too much into the into the weeds, but uh, no, yeah, no, sometimes, no. Sometimes I'm always. I, I felt like this is a, this is a good this is this is a good crowd to throw a lot of chemical structures up on the up on the screen, which is normally something that I shy away from. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, <laughs> for I'm sure. I think that's what a lot of people are looking for here. <laughs> okay. Well, good. I'm glad. <laughs> I actually did have that. Now I just thought of a question with regards to like maybe it's naive, but how how similar in sequence are these um, CAH enzymes to the ones that you mentioned are natively uh, functioning in like kind of primary pH dependent uh, buffering and all this all these other functions that is like a primary importance to the plant? How how did how did it come out as they were annotated as these CAH enzymes and then and then of course further on with this like completely completely mutated histidine triad it's now not histidines at all and 